Thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, I'm John Marcus. Uh, I'm Stephen Marcus's son. And uh, it's an honor for me to play, to start this wonderful uh, afternoon or evening uh, by playing something that, well, first of all, with a very old and dear friend of mine, Jonathan Gandelsman, who um, my father <clears throat> heard play with me for many years, and he always loved listening to us uh, sort of play things for fun, but also take things very seriously when we were rehearsing for concerts, or also hours on end playing duets together uh, in our home in Montauk or in, in the city. So uh, I thought it might be a, a wonderful way to start uh, this, this evening. Um, we're going to play for you a duet by Jean-Marie Leclerc, um, and uh, I hope you enjoy it the way I hope, if we play it well enough, my father would have as well. So thank you. Thank you. 
Welcome. I'm Eileen Galuli, and Stephen Marcus was my teacher, um, my dissertation supervisor and friend. As he once said to me when I was complaining about writing um, letters of recommendation, dissertation students are like children. They grow up, but they never really go away. There are so many of us on the program today who are dissertation students and friends of Stephen's that in order for us, the celebration of his life and work. Um, it would have been, as I think many of you know, his 90th birthday today. For it not to run the length of a Lacanian seminar, um, I ask that we all be mindful of the time. Um, the next speaker is Alfred Hornu. Hi. Um, dear Gertrude, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Alfred Hornu from the Johannes Gutenberg University in Mainz. Um, when I first met Stephen Marcus during my fellowship at the National Humanities Center in 1980, 
I had no idea how much he and his scholarship would uh, influence and shape my career. There was, of course, the personal German connection to his wife and his sustained interest in German language intellectuals, Gertrude being one of them. Early on in his career, Karl Marx, Friedrich Engels, and Sigmund Freud, whose theories reached their culmination in exile in England, informed Stephen's first scholarly love, Charles Dickens and Victorian literature. None other than Michel Foucault recognized this influence and astute literary criticism, political engagement, and psychoanalytic insight in Stephen's classic study, The Other Victorians, which French critic quoted in support of his theory on the first pages of his history of sexuality. And then there was the close relationship of Stephen and Gertrude with Alexander and Margarete Mitscherlich, German psychoanalytic authorities whom they met at the Center for Advanced Studies in Stanford and visited frequently in Frankfurt in their home next to the synagogue. It goes without saying that Stephen knew German very well. His sincere modesty would not allow him to admit it publicly. Another significant trait of his character, probably the most important one, along with his sense of humor, revealed itself during our year in North Carolina, namely his constant concern for family. His son, John, whom you just heard, was four years old at the time, and when he did not play his violin, he loved to swim. Stephen made sure that John had time for both with almost equal dedication. I remember when the family visited us in Germany, John did a repeat performance. After swimming about 100 rounds in a small swimming pool of my in-laws, he took up violin practice. Stephen was delighted. Some time later when we arrived, when we invited Stephen to participate in a conference, uh, he spoke on the humanities at the end of centuries from the classics to cultural studies, and he argued for classical standards over flashy methodologies. In private, he emphatically spoke of the value of families and the importance of having children in spite of professional hazard. Maybe he was responsible at the time for my wife and me to start thinking about a family. Part of his thinking in terms of family also inspired his work for academic families. As the chair of this academic community here at, at uh, Columbia, founding director of the Humanities Center in North Carolina. It was also a sign of his concern for young colleagues that he invited me to join Columbia faculty in 1986 when I wrote to him about the miserable job situation in Germany. I wonder what would have happened to me had I stayed on at Columbia rather than returning to a position in Germany after the year. Eventually, the Columbia connection became the basis of an exchange program of PhD candidates which Stephen carefully maneuvered through all bureaucratic fund hurdles. For 20 years, doctoral candidates from Columbia and the University of Mines profited immensely from a stay abroad, Columbia graduates offering their expertise to our American study students, Mines graduates serving as research assistants and enjoying the cooperation with top scholars as well as the excellent library resources, let alone New York City. Of course, Stephen knew about the differences between the German educational system and the superior American one. His wish to seek a balance between the two corresponds to his overall concern to promote scholarship regardless of financial sources along aspects of quality. Many participants of this exchange program have now moved on and have attained important professorial positions in Europe or North America Others work in academic organizations ranging as far as India and New Zealand. Stephen's encyclopedic knowledge about everything, including what some of us would consider non-academic trivia, qualified him in all stages of life to move beyond the conventional frame of his discipline and envision a more comprehensive context of human endeavors. To see literature and literary criticism as a form of social engagement in the service of the humanities and the social sciences, which he pursued early on in his association with the Partisan Review, eventually proliferated into the leading role in the foundation of the National Humanities Center. At the same time, he recognized the close proximity between literature and medicine by way of his long-standing interest in psychoanalysis. 
It is no coincidence that he started moved, moving into the common ground of both literary and medical research and prepared the path for his doctoral candidates to follow. Rita Charon, Maura Spiegel, Siri Huswit now pursue his transdisciplinary ideas as scholar and writer and have set up or participate in the program of narrative medicine. I'm very glad and grateful um, to Stephen and his disciples that they have offered a cooperation along the line of the narrative medicine program to my university. When I told Stephen about this new level of cooperation between our universities last year in February, when we visited him and Gertrude in Montauk, he was very happy to know that we had organized two narrative medicine workshops in Mainz together with the Columbia colleagues and that this academic vision for cross-disciplinary research or maybe a return to a more comprehensive academic education had also inspired us to realize a doctoral training program on life sciences and life writing financed by the German Research Foundation funding students to pursue degrees in medicine, the natural sciences, and the humanities. Stephen's unusual combination <clears throat> of erudition and vision for the evolution of academic education and the disciplines motivated us to invite Stephen for a guest professorship to assist us in our endeavors to advance American studies and its position as a bridge between the disciplines. We had tried to find a decent accommodation appropriate for his eminent status, but he opted to take a very ordinary room in the guest house of the physical education department, simply because it would allow him to walk to his office and be independent. At the time, my colleagues could not understand that Stephen came to his office every day of the week in the morning, working diligently until late in the evening, teaching and advising students. His exemplary dedication to scholarship and his belief in self-discipline as a prerequisite for ex expertise in the discipline worked wonders. When I suggested as dean to award him an honorary doctoral degree, the decision was unanimous. Stephen's honorary degree was the first one the Department of English and Linguistics awarded. It came uh, immediately after awarding Pope John Paul an uh, honorary degree. In May of 2005, we had a festive award ceremony with the president of the university. The only dissonance came from a violent performance, God will you remember, which I thought would compensate for John's absence, but the poor musician failed miserably. We hear the original here. Since Stephen's enthusiasm for advancing the humanities never stopped, when we drove through the city of Frankfurt after his talk at the Sigmund Freud Institute in the fall of 1989, we heard the news of the opening up of the East and the impending fall of the wall in Berlin. He immediately seized the occasion, uh, this historic situation, as a specific moment for new perspectives in the humanities and encouraged me to write an essay about it. He also encouraged me to begin a program of Honors English for Excellent Students which we were able to realize a few years later. His insistence on founding a human center in Germany after the American model eventually also came to pass. When I last talked to Stephen a year ago on his birthday, he was very happy to hear that we have founded the Obama Institute for Transnational American Studies at my university. The opening ceremony took place in the Black History Month of 2017, following up on the inauguration of the current president, a German connection we are not proud of. Stephen's ideas and visions for the humanities and humankind permeated his full life and unusual career. Like his research of the other Victorians, we can consider him uh, the other academic providing insight not available elsewhere. We are very grateful for the good fortune of having shared parts of our lives with him. He lives on in our works. Thank you, Stephen, for your humanistic legacy.
Hi, I'm Richard Moy. Stephen was my teacher, my dissertation advisor, which I finished in 1990, so a long time ago. Um, but he was uh, also um, a, a, just a marvelous friend. Um, I had the great good fortune to have the fascinating experience and, and the great pleasure of helping Stephen learn how to use a computer, which I'm sure you can understand. Um, Stephen was, though, more than mentor, friend, and teacher. He was an exemplar. Um, I learned from Stephen the value of, of high expectations to push students farther than they might think they could otherwise go. And ultimately, the passage I'm going to read from the preface to Engels, Manchester, and the Working Class is a defining principle for me um, because it's the clearest articulation of what we all do um, every day as teachers and scholars and why. The present work may be regarded as part of a continuing experiment. Some of its purposes may be described as follows, to ascertain how far literary criticism can help us understand history and society, to see how far the intellectual discipline that begins with the work of close textual analysis can help us understand certain social, historical, or theoretical documents. If this work succeeds in some measure, it may perhaps have some salutary effect on literary criticism or study in its present uneasy state as well. If literary criticism is not to decline further than it already has into aesthetic or political fashionability on the one side and academic stupor on the other, it must, in my judgment, now that its heroic modern period is past, begin to draw with increasing deliberation upon the other cognitive disciplines. For literature and literary criticism are very little if they cannot sustain claim to cognitive status. Either we take literature seriously in this sense or we don't. If we don't, then we can study and discuss it in a formal or formalistic way as the arranging of patterns and designs, as a superior form of organized amusement, as a series of language games, all of which have their due place in a full account of the process. If we do, however, then we have to regard literature in ways that are comparable to the ways we regard any of the essential and fundamental human activities, such as language, sexuality, or economics, although literature itself may not be ultimately irreducible, as these three seem to be. And by the same token, we have to regard the study of literature with the same seriousness that we regard the disciplines of study appropriate to these other activities. This, of course, is no place to argue theoretically the case for literature and the study of literature as modes of knowledge. This much may be said, however, in brief and in passing. According to Max Weber's way of thinking, that which is distinctively and constitutively significant about human activity is that it produces meaning. Literary criticism, the study of literature, is nothing if it is not the study of meaning and meanings as they appear essentially in the forms of literature. It is, in addition, and by means of its own activity, the creation of further meaning. In these attributes, literature and literary criticism are no different from other essential human activities and the branches of study that have grown up around them. Both the activity and the discourse appropriate to it are cognitive and produce meaning. What is in this context singular and distinctive about literature is its all-inclusiveness. It draws no abstract line about itself. It confines itself to no single mode of discourse, but can include as part of its dramatic discursiveness all other modes of discourse. It rises to no one series of generalities, uniquely represents experience from that point of view, which is inaccessible to final abstract definition, and yet communicates generalities about that which cannot be abstractly stated or generally defined. It prototypically envisages human existence in the concrete in those individual instances that cannot be quantified and yet are representative. My name is Deborah Nord. Um, I was a student of Stevens first as an undergrad, a Barnard undergraduate in his Dickens seminar. And then I returned to Columbia um, to study with him and become a Victorianist. He supervised my dissertation and gave me my vocation and my career. This is the part of Engels, Manchester and the Working Class, where Stephen analyzes what he considered the best single piece of writing that Engels did, and that was called the Great Towns Chapter in the Condition of the Working Classes. Indeed, the city reveals its social or class structure in each of its important spatial arrangements. These are most notable in those zones where the two extremes approach each other, or to put the same idea in another way, at their lines of division, which is where the middle middle and lower middle classes come in. Their houses lie outside the working class belt, 
and between that belt and the more favorably situated urban estates of the upper middle class. And their shops and small businesses are located along the main thoroughfares, acting, so to speak, as insulators for the city's system of communication. Their location in space, therefore, is at, is at both critical junctures and intermediate one. And their intermediary position is not merely structural, but functional as well. They are acting as buffers between the antagonistic extremes. These streets, then, are Manchester's Potemkin villages. Yet behind the facades there lies not the nothingness of a transuralic waste, but a negative existence that is paradoxically a positive fullness. The indispensable creative source of all that positive wealth that lies beyond it. As Engels describes and analyzes them, those streets represent a collective effort of isolation, distancing, and denial, and work socially to the same ends as the same unconscious, defensive processes work toward in individual persons. All he has neglected to add is that when these symbolic aids were not available, it was possible to take to literal avoidance. These ways of dealing with experience were not confined to Manchester or to the industrial towns or even to London. Some years earlier in his essay, Civilization, John Stuart Mill had illuminated this subject from another point of view. One of the effects of civilization, not to say one of the ingredients in it, Mill wrote, is that the spectacle and even the very idea of pain is kept more and more out of the sight of those classes who enjoy in their fullness the benefits of civilization. What is striking about Mill's statement is that although it is written with the intention of the highest generality, the one thing that it fails to include is precisely the content of Engel's passage, the everyday world of labor and industry and the conditions of life which it was in which it was sustained. Furthermore, although Mill certainly sees the reciprocal and necessary connection between civilization or refinement and the concealment of pain, he does not press upon that connection with the same degree of force as Engels. For what Engels is saying is that the riches and luxury are not only connected with the hidden suffering and squalor, they are connected in such a way as to be integral components of a unified, diversified phenomenon, whose every separation is the clue to their unity, both of these manifestly made visible in the structure, structure of Manchester streets. Hello, I'm Eric Lott. I teach at the CUNY Graduate Center, and I studied with Stephen in uh, the mid to late 1980s. Uh, he was on my dissertation committee, but he was a major influence on me and my work. I chose a, a paragraph that builds actually on uh, what Richard and Deborah have had to say, uh, but I chose it because um, I have loved it for for a very long time for, for many reasons, but I think it's, it was, it's perfect for today because there's so much of Stephen in it. There is a uh, historical uh, sweep of imagination uh, built on vast erudition. There is political acuity. There's moral clarity, moral passion, moral outrage in it. There's the insistence on the relationship between literature and the real world. Uh, there's Freud. There's even a, a ludic set of cadences that seem to me Dickensian. One paragraph. What seems to have happened is that at about this moment in history, advanced middle-class consciousness, in which consciousness Engels may be regarded as representing the radical wing began to undergo one of its characteristic changes. This consciousness was abruptly disturbed by the realization that millions of English men, women, and children, children were virtually living in shit. The immediate question seems to have been whether they weren't drowning in it. The catastrophe was worse in the great industrial towns where density and overcrowding went hand in hand with the interests of speculative builders, medieval administrative procedures and regulations where they in fact existed and produced a situation in which millions of grown people and their children were compelled to live in houses and neighborhoods that, that, uh, uh, that were without drains and often without sewers. And where sewers existed, 
They took the runoff of street water and not waste from the houses without running water, sometimes not even in an, an entire neighborhood. And with one privy shared by who knows how many people. In some parts of Manchester, over 200 people shared a single privy. Such privies filled up rapidly and were cleaned out on an average of once every two years or so, which was as good as not at all. Streets were often unpaved, and where they were paved, no provision often existed for their cleansing. And large numbers of people lived in cellars, below the level of the street and below the water line. Thus, generations of human beings, out of whose lives the wealth of England was produced, were compelled to live in wealth's symbolic negative counterpart. And that substance which suffused their lives was also a virtual objectification of their social condition, their place in society. That was what they were. We must recall, good scream, perfectly timed. We must recall that this was no Freudian obsessive neurosis or anxiety dream, but it is as if the contents of such a neurosis had been produced on a wholesale scale in the real world. We can then understand rather better how those Main Street palisades were functioning. They were defensive, adaptive measures of confinement and control. And we can understand what they were concealing. Plenty. What we're queuing up is um, uh, part of a sound recording um, that, that Stephen recorded in the 80s on Karl Marx and Sigmund Freud in the 1980s. We've had access to many of the recordings that were done mostly through the National Humanities Center over the decades. And we want to we share some of the conversations between Stephen and Arnie Cooper. And later in the program, we have a short video selection also. So um, I'm hoping the two of them can bring his voice to us. While, while, they're, while they're doing that, let me just say what... what the little thing that I need to say about um, Stephen's influence on, on medicine. Uh, our, Alfred has already talked about uh, the genesis of that. Um, I'm Rita Sharon. I'm, I'm now, because of Stephen, a chair of the Department of Medical Humanities and Ethics at Columbia at the medical school, one of the first uh, departments like this in the country. And it's because of him. And it's because in the 70s, uh, Stephen was bringing graduate students from English, from anthropology, from history, from philosophy. He was kind of hauling them up to the uptown campus. They didn't quite know why. So why do we have to go to a conference in the genetics department? And Stephen said, because you need to know something about Tay-Sachs disease. And they would go, and soon they were riveted in the study of what what medicine needs from their disciplines. And soon enough, he had them doing projects, reading the Psychiatric Institute records of how uh, patients with mental illness were described, and working in the neonatal intensive care unit with children born with serious uh, congenital diseases, and how the narrative process between the series of doctors and nurses and social workers on the one hand and the parents and the siblings on the other. And how did those pivotal uh, narrative processes come, come to be? So he showed us how to learn that which his graduate students knew that up until then we didn't know. How are we doing? We're good? Marx was a revolutionary, and being a revolutionary, uh, almost by definition, had to be an optimist, uh, unless uh, you're a revolutionary who thinks the revolution is going to lose. Uh, and uh, Freud was, uh, was certainly revolutionary in his thought, but he was not a revolutionary socially. He wasn't deliberately revolutionary. He no, wasn't. He, oh, he was deliberately revolutionary in his thinking. There's uh -huh. no question of that. He, was, as he wanted to make a radical new theory of how human beings were. But he certainly did not believe that uh, a social revolution would put an end to uh, the ills or uh, discontents of mankind. However, there is at one point, I, it seems to me, where they both converge here, which makes for an interesting complication. Both of them place the role of conflict as central to life as we've known it until now. That is to say, Marx sees social conflict or class conflict as central and Freud sees conflicts between 
inner impulses of various kinds and between the individual person and civilization as constitutive of existence. The difference between them is that Marx, it's possible for Marx to envisage, although he doesn't talk about it very much, sometime in the future when the revolution has taken place where these great conflicts will have been done away with. And that, for Freud, is an impossible vision. The early Marx, at least, believed that human beings were living in what he called an alienated state, that the nature of uh, social development and economic development had produced a state of affairs in which man, you, every human beings, or every working, laboring human beings, essential human essence had been alienated from him. And what he originally thought of uh, as the revolution achieving would be the dis would be disalienation, that is, the, 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 re, the reappro reappropriation of, by man of his own humanity. Insofar as psychoanalysis represents the, a therapeutic effort at introspection uh, and at refinding, as it were, a center of oneself that one has lost and reintegrating oneself, there is a similarity. And here's where they uh, come together. Here, here is where they come. Marx, however, believed that it could, it could happen on a historical and global scale. Mm -hmm. Freud, however, limited, had, had more, uh, as it were, modest aims and views. He, he thought it, 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 it could be done, one, it had to be done one by one. However, as you'll recall, I think, in Civilization and the Discontents, I believe, he says at one point, well, perhaps if men's relation to property changed, a great difference could be made in history. So at least there is a small, op there is that, that one sentence which represents a small opening uh, in Freud toward, uh, toward in that direction. Hi, I'm Tanya Holloway. Um, Stephen was a teacher, a mentor, dissertation advisor, and very, very dear friend. Um, I'm going to give a radically abridged reading from his essay on Pickwick Papers, which is a characteristic, wide-ranging, uh, deep-thinking, always illuminating tour de force. What is the Pickwickian sense? If we recall that the first chapter begins with the logos and the word Pickwickians, we can begin by suggesting that it is a sense in which the word is seized creatively in the first instance almost as a kind of doodle, as a play of the pen, as a kind of verbal scribble or game. It is the word or verbal expression actively regarded not primarily as conscious imitation of either nature or pre-existent models, but rather as largely unconscious invention, whose meaning is created essentially as it is spontaneously uttered or written down. It is language with the shackles removed from certain of its deeper creative powers, which henceforth becomes capable of a constant, rapid, and virtually limitless multiplication of its own effects and forms in new inventions and combinations and configurations. In Pickwick papers, the English novel becomes, as it were, airborne. What we have, in short, is something rather new and spectacular. For Dickens has committed himself at the outset of Pickwick Papers to something like pure language, to, to pure writing, excuse me, to language itself. No novelist had, I believe, ever done this in such a measure before. In addition, the commitment was paradoxically ensured and enforced by the circumstance of compelled spontaneity in which Dickens wrote by the necessity he accepted of turning it out every month, of being regularly spontaneous and self-generatingly creative on demand. Dickens was, if it may be said, undertaking to let the writing write the book. But then, in the person of the law, Pickwick and Dickens run into something which, though it may seem at first to be an unalloyed linguistic universe, is in fact much more than a world of words. It is, and it represents, society and its structures, in particular those structures known as property and money, both extra-linguistic phenomena. Property and money are more than words, and words cannot make you free of them. It is a matter of the very largest moment for Dickens' development as a writer, and a testimony to his exceptional inner integrity, that he should, in the midst of his greatest celebration of his freedom and transcendence as a genius of language, 
engage himself imaginatively in those very conditions which were calculated most powerfully to nullify that freedom. It is, it seems to me, no accident that Dickens installed that negativity at the dramatic center of his first and freest novel, at the very moment when he was sustaining himself with a freedom that was virtually unexampled in the history of the novel. The consequences that such a creative act of courage had are known to us all. They are nothing less than Dickens' long and arduous subsequent development, a development that, as the later novels make increasingly clear, is in fact a search for a wider, a more general, and a truly human freedom. Thank you. Hello, I'm James Bizard. Uh, like a lot of people here, I studied with Stephen in the 1980s. Uh, I, I wrote my dissertation under his direction, took a number of fabulous seminars with him, read his work and have continued to do so over the decades with never-ending illumination and stimulation. Uh, I've chosen a passage from his essay about George Eliot in representations, and in this uh, essay, he expatiates on what he calls the quasi or virtual systematic social theory existing imminently in, and on occasion explicitly in, the novels of George Eliot. And this passage, uh, exemplifies for me Stephen's uncanny way of bringing together intellectual rigor and seriousness with dashing verve and humor uh, and a kind of daring uh, insouciance that um, I, I never stop uh, being amazed at. So, society in these novels is represented as a living whole composed or articulated of differentiated members each of which fulfills or possesses a special function. As a consequence, the individual person is not separable from the human whole, and in turn the social whole is equally dependent on each individual person, since each contributes to the common life. Society and individual persons, then, are not separable or distinct phenomena, but are in reality the collective and distributive aspects of the same circumstance or thing. One result of this circumstance is that freedom, such freedom as we may have, is exercised largely, if not exclusively, through cooperation with others. We are, as it were, enveloped by the larger sentiments, attitudes, and habits of the collective world in which we live. This is principally why so many people find it difficult to understand or to communicate with people from outside their groups or societies. And this is why our manners and customs seem to us as if they were creatures of nature and not just conventions of culture. Sympathy, in short, is the power of communion itself. And it is not merely a social sentiment, it is the enabling social sentiment it is the sentiment, beyond all others, of unification and solidarity. I had gotten just to the point at which my abstract synopsis breaks off, namely to the discussion of the meaning and function of sympathy in George Eliot, when it struck me that actually I didn't know what I was talking about. I had read George Eliot often and closely enough to believe that I understood what she meant by it, and I had read enough of the comment on her to understand what her commentators took her to mean by it, but what in fact was sympathy itself? Since Immanuel Kant was fresh in my mind, the impossibility of answering that question when it was put in such a form speedily uh, followed the question itself. The next best thing, perhaps, was to try to determine what the early sociologists or social philosophers of her own time, or maybe slightly later, meant when they used the term. I began to go through a number of likely-seeming books from the period, and in due time I came, I came across this work, Human Nature and the Social Order, by Charles, Charles Horton Cooley. In the index, there were several references under the entry, Sympathy. I turned to the appropriate places and found a number of passages that began more or less like this. Sympathy, as George Eliot says, 
To find the dog catching up with his tail is not an uncommon experience in the pursuit of literary studies. I must confess, however, that I felt a twinge of schadenfreude when I discovered an instance of it in the social sciences. It's rather encouraging to feel now and then that we're all together in the same leaky intellectual boat. This theory is applied with considerable rigor, I believe, and with one exception. The exception is that George Eliot, on important occasions, does not apply it to herself. It is, a bad, it is a bad critical practice to chide writers for what they have failed to do, and I disapprove of this habit in others. I cannot help wondering, however, what George Eliot's fiction would have been like had she applied this theory to herself with greater consistency. Her novels would, I believe, have been even more extraordinary than they are now. Hi, I'm Maura Spiegel, and another student of Stevens. Also, he was my dissertation advisor. I wrote on Charles Dickens, and Stephen woke me up to what was radical in Dickens. I, you know, really changed everything for me. I chose this little passage from Dickens to share because I keep thinking about what it was like to sit in that classroom with him, the particular energy that would be there that was in none of the other classes I took. Um, this is a very small passage from Little Dorrit uh, that I remember Stephen reading aloud to our seminar around 1980. He let the passage sink in, commenting only that Dickens did not look away. She was about eight and twenty with large bones, large features, large feet and hands, large eyes and no hair. Her large eyes were limpid and almost colorless. They seemed to be very little affected by light and to stand unnaturally still. There was also that attentive listening expression in her face, which is seen in the faces of the blind. But she was not blind, having one tolerably serviceable eye. Her face was not exceedingly ugly, though it was only redeemed from being so by a smile, a good-humored smile, and pleasant in itself, but rendered pitiable by being constantly there. Um, <clears throat> I'm Deirdre David. Um, in, I think it was spring 1975, I went to see Stephen to tell him that I had decided on my dissertation topic. I wanted to write on Elizabeth Gaskell. <clears throat> he looked at me very sternly and said, I don't think you want to do that, Mrs. David. <laughs> and of course I didn't, as I realized very quickly. Um, <laughs> instead, he suggested, urged rather, that I explore the significance of the novel in the Victorian period. And of course, I set to work on that immediately and abandoned all thought of Elizabeth Gaskell, except I managed in the end to get it into my dissertation. Um, I did a lot of reading, of course, about the Victorian novel. And along the way, I came to the other Victorians. And the passage that I'm going to read now is preceded by the narrator of My Secret Life um, relating his brutal rape of a 15-year-old farm girl. And um, I want to read it because I think in this passage you just hear very simply but quite wonderfully Stephen's moral voice. He says, this is the kind of thing one wants to say that it was all about. This is the kind of thing that the Victorian novelists could not but be aware of, even though their explicit dealings with it were very circumspect, that their work as a whole was directed against. If we read the Victorian novel against the context of such scenes, 
we get a renewed and increased sense of how humanizing a work that genre was. Such scenes have, of course, taken place since time immemorial. They help constitute the very stuff of what we sometimes like to call traditional civilization. And such scenes continued without question to occur in Victorian England. What had changed was the consciousness with which these happenings were regarded. The Victorian novel was among the chief agents of that new and altered consciousness. For the first time in history, it could be asserted before what almost amounted to a mass audience and in a public way, the persons of the lower social orders were not to be treated in that way. Such treatment was now understood as an intolerable violation of that human nature, which, again, effectively, for the first time in history, members of the lower social classes shared fully with their betters, that is, ourselves. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Nancy Youssef. Uh, I'm currently at Rutgers after many years at CUNY. Uh, I was also a student of Stevens. I wrote my dissertation with him uh, on sympathy in Romantic Era literature as it happens, uh, or rather on how no one really knows what that term means um, still. Uh, it was the 1990s, and there were many flamboyant personalities in the department then. Stephen was strangely charismatic in his reserve communicating intellectual passion and earnestness when irony and suspicion were the dominant critical moods of the day. So the first of two short passages I'll read um, dates from exactly that time. Uh, this passage describes the homeless, impoverished, friendless figure of Joe in Bleak House and uh, reminds me of the ethically complex, unsentimental Dickens Stephen taught us to read in a seminar that many people here were, uh, were in with me on uh, 19th century literature and society. Uh, so this is Stephen. Uh, Joe seems virtually not of the same species as we, or part of the same order of nature. He belongs to nothing and no one, and yet he is at the same time in his radical isolation deeply connected with us, with the social world of the narrative, with the social world that the narrative refers to and that yet resonates with the social world today. Our denial of his common speciesihood with us, our denial of his brotherhood, is for Dickens proof itself of the obverse. The homeless are, among much else, a nuisance, an eyesore, an offense, a bother, and an expense. It is next to impossible not to respond with ambivalence to them. But what Dickens reminded his readers of in this small but expressive section of Bleak House is that however mixed and ill-assorted and imperfectly controlled our feelings and responses may be, we are responsible for them. Um, my second passage appears in a very recent essay uh, from um, 2014 and contains this remarkably fresh recollection of reading Freud's introductory lectures on psychoanalysis for the first time. There was something peculiar about this first acquaintance. As I was reading along, I found myself repeatedly pausing and inwardly remarking, oh, this really seems to be true. It is true. Or this is something like truth, if not the truth. And simultaneously, I had a virtually physical sensation, perception, feeling that my mind was turning or being turned, although I was unable to articulate the direction of the movement. It did not belong to an order of experience that one has very often in an intellectual life. I myself have had it on only four other occasions, when I first read Plato and Shakespeare and later Dickens and Wordsworth. Stephen goes on to describe these readings as establishing a range of verbal, affective, and conceptual markers, soundings, by which I might grope my way along as I staggered through one after another world-creating and world-annihilating intensity of literary cultural imagination. And um, I think we're all here to thank Stephen for helping us straggle along on the same path. 
what Freud gave us is the first or, or uh, uh, the current most comprehensive theory of psychology that we have. It's the most general, large-scale uh, psychology that uh, exists now. And there were certain other elements that went into it uh, as well, uh, which have which which uh, correspond to that part of Freud's mind which had a scientific ambition to it, since he had a very complex mind, part of which was scientific in its ambitions and part of which were extra scientific. And the first one of these, which I think was very important, is that Freud uh, installed the notion that introspection or self-examination could be something like a scientific activity, mm -hmm. uh, that it was not simply contemplation or philosophical, but could be, as it were, brought within the constraints of what was thought of as science. He, he was legitimizing it after a fashion, is that right? Legitimizing it and formalizing it in a certain way and subjecting it to kinds of checks and controls that it had not been formally. Now, self-examination is a very profound part of the Western tradition, mm -hmm. beginning, beginning with the Greeks. But what Freud did was to bring the whole idea of introspection or self-examination to a new, a new level of discourse. Yeah, I think another thing that, that, that Freud did was to uh, bypass one of the problems that's plagued Western thinking, which is the split between mind and body. Uh -huh. uh, in Freud's thinking, there, there, there was no such split because he located his thinking directly on the line that separates mind and body, and indeed his first cases, uh, and where he made his first great discoveries, were in fact with people, named, namely people suffering from hysteria, who were suffering from somatic symptoms such as paralysis, deafness, uh, blindness, uh, lameness, and uh, a, a ver variety of physical symptoms which had in fact psychic or mental causes. If we think of art, or literature, or education, or child-rearing, or sexuality, or the relations between men and women, there's no area there where Freud has not had a profound effect. Mm -hmm. That is to say, his effect has been as great as that of any thinker that one can imagine in the modern world. Hi, I'm Dr. Susan Vaughn. I'm a psychiatrist, a psychoanalyst, and the director at Columbia Psychoanalytic Center. I regret that I didn't have the opportunity to know Stephen Marcus personally, a fact that really led me to puzzle about how I would do his memory justice today. Of course, it would be easy to simply recount his many accomplishments and his impact on the field of psychoanalysis. Marcus's early psychoanalytic lens on the characters of Charles Dickens and his revelatory analysis of sexual subcultures in 19th century Britain and the other Victorians alone uh, would qualify as major contributions. These work helped Marcus to establish the field of psychoanalytic literary criticism that is seen today in every major university worldwide. The psychoanalytic lens has also helped keep psychoanalytic ideas alive within universities in a time when people are more interested in listening to Prozac than on lying on the, on the couch in psychoanalyst's offices. Marcus also made important contributions to the psychoanalytic canon itself co-editing and abridging Ernst Jones' ponderous three-volume The Life and Works of Sigmund Freud with Lionel Trilling, distilling it into a single, much more readable, and therefore much more useful, volume. And Marcus was still considering Freud's impact in his 1984 book, Freud and the Culture of Psychoanalysis, in which he explored the transition from Victorian humanism to modernity. During this period, Dr. Marcus also created a series of books on psychoanalysis and culture, um, with psychoanalysted friend Dr. Arnie Cooper, who's the other person in the soundings that we're hearing just now. A mere recitation of, of Dr. Marcus's accomplishments related to psychoanalysis and his founding of the use of psychoanalytic ideas and literary criticism, impressive though they are, hardly seem to me to illuminate the man. This led me to decide to take a page from Dr. Marcus himself and to try to read his texts as a way of explicating the man who wrote them, using the modes of of uh, examining closely texts that he himself developed. By the time Stephen Marcus was born in 1928, a depressed and cocaine-dependent Sigmund Freud was struggling with jaw cancer and with the manuscript of civilization and its discontents, his rather dyspeptic view of religion, civilization, and human nature. When Stephen was 11, Freud, displaced from Vienna to London due to the war, died. 
With grandparents who had immigrated from Vilnius, Lithuania, and a father who was unemployed as an accountant during the Great Depression, Marcus's childhood was marked by financial insecurity, but apparent intellectual richness. This brilliant, bookish Jewish boy grew up in the Bronx and attended William Howard Taft and DeWitt Clinton High Schools, graduating at 15. At Columbia, he has had his first introduction to Freud, reading Freud's introductory lectures on psychoanalysis and a humanities course. Amidst many of the other masters of modernity, such as Melville, Dostoevsky, William James, D.H. Lawrence, Kafka, and Proust. Of the experience he wrote, and you've heard parts of this, but I think they bear repeating. It was an advantage, I believe, to have read Freud for the first time among other immensely distinguished minds, writers who were in the course of radically departing from what had been generally accepted as canonical forms, conceptions, and conventions of representation. To take up one week after another such realizations as Bartleby the Scrivener, Women in Love, Varieties of Religious Experience, Beyond Good and Evil, Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man, Swan's Way, and The Trial, was to set oneself up for regular spiritual violence, for being repeatedly knocked over the head and simultaneously observing the ground disappear beneath one's feet. I imagine Marcus stepping into Freud's life and shoes as he was struck by how Freud, quote, affirmed the other than rational, more primitive, childish, marginal, and dysfunctional manifestations of mental life. As I was reading along, he wrote, I found myself repeatedly pausing and for a moment inwardly remarking, oh, this really seems to be true. It is true. And simultaneously, simultaneously I had a virtually physical sensation, perception, feeling that it was certainly not um, and entirely conscious, nor at the same time was I concerned with understanding it. It did not belong, however, to an order of experience that one has very often in intellectual life. Taking this love of a psychoanalytic lens forward, Marcus applied it to Dickens' early novels, linking Dickens' glaring faults of staginess and sentimentality in his fiction to the deep wounds of his personal life related to poverty, shame, and family separation in childhood. Even as Marcus began to study and write, he continued to absorb the intellectual life around him like a sponge, recalling later that partisan review, quote, provided a singular ex experience of intellectual awakening and intensity. I did not read each issue so much as I gulped it down. A chance meeting with an archivist at the Kinsey Institute while teaching at Indiana University started Marcus to research and write the other Victorians. Picture him as a 33-year-old academic, who has just spent five years co-editing and abridging the life and times of Sigmund Freud with his mentor, Lionel Trilling. And now here he is, raiding the Kinsey Institute archives, perhaps with a sense of naughty excitement, a desire to see the truth of sexuality in the Victorian era. Physician um, William Acton's writings represent the mainstream view, with Acton anxiously denying the existence of childhood sexuality, even as he makes elaborate recommendations to suppress it, given the widespread legal and medical panics over masturbation, which was assumed to cause mental alienation, insanity, and death from loss of sperm. Marcus contrasts these official views with the clandestine circulation of pornography, studying the anonymous 11-volume pornographic memoir, My Secret Life, and coining the term pornutopia to describe a utopian fantasy of abundance where, quote, all men are always and infinitely potent, all women fecundate with lust and flow inexhaustibly with sap or juice or both. Everyone is always ready for everything. Pornutopia conjures not just a utopia, but also a cornucopia, a horn of plenty, a very different image of Victorian sexuality than had ever before been proffered. I picture his excitement, intellectual and otherwise, with Marcus thinking to himself, wow, and this is my work. Sometimes sitting in my office, I know how he feels. However much fun it was, though, Marcus's work opened the truth of an era and set off a flurry of scholarship in 19th century cultural studies on sexuality, including that of Foucault. A pattern in Marcus's life begins to emerge here, an emphasis on knowledge and truth as freedoms that allow us to know and to wonder. It seems perfectly logical to me that, that as Marcus grew in power and status within Colombia, he would have felt a duty to protest the Vietnam War during the turbulent times of sit-ins on campus. He became a member and an organizer of the Columbia Faculty Peace Action Committee, which endorsed academic strikes as a tactic to bring an end to the war and to pressure the university into withdrawing its support for war research. 
Perhaps his 1974 work about Engels on urbanization and its discontents in 1980, I'm sorry, 1840s Manchester was an oblique critique of cultural shifts and their unintended consequences here at home. A year later, Marquis famously flew to England to testify as an expert witness, expert defense witness for Arthur Dobson, the publisher, and some suggested the author of My Secret Life, the pornographic volume he'd studied in the other Victorians. When pressed by the prosecutor to answer whether the account of sex with a 10-year-old girl at Valhall Gardens was not the most evil passage he had ever read, Marcus replied that the accounts of Nazi concentration camps in the 20th century or of 13-year-old Victorian chimney sweeps dying of cancer of the scrotum in the 19th century were more evil, but that no one advocated suppressing this knowledge. The same theme of truth and, the, and intellectual freedom likely led Marcus to found the National Humanities Center and to locate it in North Carolina rather than a place like New York. North Carolina, a place that likely had less of the influence of the humanities that Marcus so appreciated. And speaking of truth and freedom, Marcus was also an early critic of political correctness, characterizing it as a new incarnation of Orwell's, quote, soft totalitarianism. He described the victimhood, resentment, and malice that I believe we see uh, much of today. He foresaw that political correctness is not always some newfound embodiment of freedom for all, but can easily become its own straitjacket as well. In, honoring of turning, in honor of turning 85, Dr. Marcus wrote his 2014 essay, Reading and Rereading Freud. In it, he recalled his ad adolescent self's, quote, unshakable sensation that the magisterial work by Freud in common with other modernist masterpieces, was reading me. The experience awakened in me a peculiar inkling or suspicion that I too was somehow, and in some ways, a text to be read, interpreted, explained, and perhaps even turned into a narrative account. Looking back at 85, the story of his life largely written, Marcus writes of reading Freud, one comes to know oneself in the course of a journey, but only after one has been confounded in darkness and discovered that the straightaway has been lost. The path is perilous, and one needs a guide and companion to usher one into and through this enigmatic, terrifying, and undiscovered world. Among that much else, it contains elements of undoing, but also of reiterating, of tautological circling around, of resuming after long interruption, and of continuously taking up unfinished business. He evokes Dante's purgatory, comparing it to the experience of Freud's psychoanalysis, which shows us by, quote, mimetic reflection, refraction, and inversion, the crooked ways by which we have come to ourselves and to be ourselves. One surmises that Freud was Virgil to Marcus's Dante, a necessary companion guiding him through the underworld of human unconsciousness with its terrifying and enigmatic qualities, its labyrinths. If Freud remained in his own kind of hell, having had no guide beside his own self-analysis to lead him through psychoanalytic purgatory and to paradise, Marcus was much more able to use the psychoanalytic method as a lamp to light his way. In turn, his students enjoyed his light as their guide, formidable, encyclopedic, rigorous, and kind, with a shared joy in knowing, living, and being. It is clear to me that for Dr. Marcus, paradise was a place with a commitment to truth and freedom, and the freedom it brings, personal and intellectual. I believe that psychoanalysis was a perfect fit for Dr. Marcus because freedom is also what psychoanalysis is all about. The analyst Rollo May once said, the analytic method is one in which the urge to label and define is repeatedly undone by a subversive curiosity and a wish to violate common understanding by turning things on their heads. The psychoanalytic method constructs a space characterized by the posing and then merging of opposites, by the endless undoing of certainty. Some think psychoanalysts help people to decide, but I think, and I think Dr. Marcus would agree, that really, analysts help people to wonder. Finding certainty uncertain and wondering wonderful is a gift that Stephen Marcus has left us all in his approach to his work, his political beliefs, and his life. As Dr. Marcus discovered, it is possible to come to know the essence of someone through studying his writings, but how I wish I could have enjoyed a glass of wine on that beautiful Montauk home over sunset and talk with him about Freud. Thank you. Uh, I'm Jonas Siegel. I teach in the English department at Rutgers. Uh, I met Stephen Marcus in 1987 
when I came to Columbia to work on my PhD. Um, I have uh, endless reasons to be grateful for his patience with that project and the kind of uh, uh, unsatisfiable rigor, which I certainly never satisfied. Um, two strengths that uh, Stephen as a scholar uh, and teach, uh, two strengths of Stephen as a scholar and a teacher were in fact his openness to a wide range of materials and the clear and committed passion he brought to their study. His was not a lowering genius, a cultural studies that planed out distinction. He gloried in admiration and in critical judgment. He also was extraordinarily good at responding to something short of full success to dynamic situations that revealed something important by not working out as expected. It made him an extraordinary dissertation advisor and a galvanizing reader. Here he is on Freud's great case study of Dora and on Freud himself. This is from the conclusion. And it's just in the passage just before the one Dreidra read. <clears throat> there is a reciprocating process in the analyst known as the counter transference. And in the case of Dora, this went wrong too. Although Freud describes Dora at the beginning of the account as being, quote, in the first bloom of youth, a girl of intelligent and engaging looks, unquote, almost nothing attractive about her comes forth in the course of the writing. As it unwinds and it becomes increasingly evident that Dora is not responding adequately to Freud, it also becomes clear that Freud is not responding favorably to this response and that he doesn't, in fact, like Dora very much. He doesn't like her negative sexuality, her inability to surrender to her own erotic impulses. He doesn't like her, quote, really remarkable achievements in the direction of intolerable behavior, unquote. He doesn't like her endless reproachfulness. Above all, he doesn't like her inability to surrender herself to him. For what Freud was as yet unprepared to face was not merely the transference, but the counter-transference as well. In the case of Dora, it was largely a negative counter-transference an unanalyzed, unanalyzed part of himself. I should like to suggest that this cluster of unanalyzed impulses and ambivalences was in part responsible for Freud's writing of this great text immediately after Dora left him. It was his way uh, of dealing with, mastering, expressing, and neutralizing such material. Yet the neutral neutralization was not complete. Or we can put the matter in another way and state that Freud's creative honesty was such that it compelled him to write the case of Dora as he did, and that his writing has allowed us to make out in this remarkable fragment a still fuller picture. As I have said before, this fragment of Freud's is more complete and coherent than the fullest case study of anyone else. Freud's case histories are a new form of literature. They are creative narratives that include their own analysis and interpretation. Nevertheless, like the living works of literature that they are, the material they contain is always richer than the original analysis and interpretation that accompany it. And this means that future generations will recur to these works and will find in them a language they are seeking and a story they need to be told. Discovered one day that the pathological symptoms of certain neurotic patients have a sense. On this discovery, the psychoanalytic method of treatment was founded. It happened in the course of this treatment that patients, instead of bringing forward their symptoms, brought forward dreams. A suspicion thus arose that the dreams, too, had a sense. He was a very widely educated uh, uh, person, uh, too. Uh, and from very early on in life, he wanted to be uh, someone who made a difference intellectually. Uh, too. He thought of being a philosopher, he thought of being a, a novelist, he wrote some poems. Uh, he certainly wanted, in some sense, always to write. He knew Shakespeare, for example, very well uh, and could pull out quotations uh, 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 all the time, and he did. Uh, too. And he also liked to read Viennese popular writers uh, uh, as well, uh, uh, such as uh, uh, Nestroy, uh, and he, quote, he was always quoting Viennese jokes. Good evening. I'm Alan Stewart. I'm currently chair of the Department of English and Comparative Literature here at Columbia. And like Dr. Vaughan, I never met Stephen Marcus. By the time I arrived in Morningside Heights 15 years ago, Professor Marcus was in his final year at Columbia. 
I do remember the door occasionally being opened to his office at 610 Philosophy Hall, an intimidating corridor of books, but somehow our paths never crossed. But now as chair, I've become increasingly aware of the legacy of Stephen Marcus on the intellectual and institutional life, not only of my department, but of Columbia as a whole. For though Professor Marcus's influence can be felt far beyond this campus, his was a Columbia career through and through. Stephen Marcus spent most of his academic life in the Department of English and Comparative Literature at Columbia. Um, after graduating high school at 15, as we heard, he won scholarships to both Harvard and Columbia, but he chose Columbia, or Columbia was chosen for him, because its location allowed him to live at home and save money on room and board. He gained his BA in 1948, majoring in English. He then entered the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences, gaining his MA in 1949, and embarking on a PhD. While he was writing his doctoral dissertation, Marcus taught at Indiana and the City College of New York, won a two-year Fulbright Fellowship to Cambridge, spent two years in the Army, and published his first articles of literary criticism. But it was to Columbia to which he returned as an instructor in 1956, completing his dissertation, Dickens from Pickwick to Dombey, in 1961. Joining Columbia's English department in the mid-1940s meant encountering some of the leading names of British and American literary studies of any institution or any era. In 1993, Marcus recalled that, quote, the teachers who meant the most to me were Lionel Trilling and Jack Barzan. Both of them helped turn me in the direction I wanted to have in academic life. And that's a very interesting sentence, the more you think about it. Among other key influences, he identified with the classic scholar Moses Hadass, the Shakespearean Andrew Chiappe, and the Henry James specialist Fred Dupuis, who supervised his MA thesis. In time, Marcus would be a colleague of many of these men, sometimes collaborating closely. Indeed, collaboration across disciplines, across institutions, was a hallmark of his career at Columbia. With Lionel Trilling, as we have heard already, he co-edited and abridged one volume version of Ernest Jones' three-volume biography of Freud. As early as 1962, Marcus was teaching an interdepartmental seminar with sociologist Daniel Bell, with the idea that topics should change each semester. An early choice was 19th century revolutionary movements. In his later career, his interest in the, lit in the relationship between literature and, hum and medicine led him to be named principal investigator in the Columbia Project on Conflicts in Values and Healthcare. These wide-ranging intellectual interests, psychoanalysis, sociology, narrative medicine, all fueled his teaching, research, and publication. Marcus rose through the ranks here with some speed. From assistant professor in 61, he was promoted to associate in 1963, and full professor four years later, and was named George Delacorte Professor in the Humanities in 1976. But as a senior academic, he embraced service, he served as chairman of the Department of English and Comparative Literature twice, which I think is excessive, from 1977 to 80 and from 1985 to 89. In 1979, he chaired a 19 member presidential commission on academic priorities in the arts and sciences, whose report concluded that Columbia had slipped in many ways from being one of the very few distinguished universities in the United States to being one among a larger number of universities in the first rank. Marcus was so central to the commission that its findings became known as the Marcus Report. A gloomy faculty meeting in 1992 was reportedly enlivened when Donald Hood, a former vice president in arts and sciences said, I'd like to acknowledge Stephen Marcus who was named after a famous academic commission of the late 70s. In 1993, President George Rupp named Marcus Dean of Columbia College and vice president for arts and sciences simultaneously. At some point in the past, Marcus had remarked that it's easier to move a graveyard than to move a college faculty. Now he admitted, I'm in the course of learning how to qualify that remark. But moving a graveyard was perhaps one challenge too many, and two years later he returned to teaching, retiring to become a professor emeritus in 2004. As all the testimonies today have shown, Marcus was a tough but inspiring teacher. In 1997, he won the Mark Van Doren Teaching Award for his, quote, humanity, devotion to truth, and inspiring leadership in undergraduate teaching. But it, it, he had a long track record as a graduate supervisor. 
Recently, I found in my office a dusty file that contained a typewritten list of the Columbia English PhDs of the 1970s. It's a fascinating document that captures the prolific supervisors of the period, Carl Woodring, George Stade, John Rosenberg, John Unterecker, uh, Carolyn Heilbrunn, Edward Taylor, and Stephen Marcus. Marcus's list of dissertations is notable in two ways. First, while most of his peers were still dealing primarily with formalist literary topics, Marcus's PhDs asked questions that were both literary and social. They addressed Dickens, Eliot, Carlyle, but through topics like the socialization of the child, woman as orphan, the nature of society, concerns that seem far closer to the topics of more recent students. Second, at a time when Columbia's English PhD students were two-thirds men, Marcus had a remarkable number of women as students. Among them was Kate Millett, whose Marcus supervised PhD became the 1970 sex Sexual Politics. Its acknowledgments thank Marcus for giving every page a most careful reading and for being an advisor who could always find time and patience to insist rhetoric give way to reason. I cannot imagine where Marcus found those reserves of time and patience. I haven't touched here on his formidable output of over 200 publications, his long list of awards and honors, nor his pioneering efforts in establishing institutions beyond this campus. But his contributions to Columbia alone over 60 years as undergraduate, graduate student, professor, department chair, dean, vice president, and presidential commission explain why we're all here this evening. I never met Stephen Marcus, but I now I wish I had. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm uh, Andrew Del Banco. Stephen was my colleague and in many ways my mentor for uh, more than 20 years. Uh, as everyone who has preceded me up here today, I'm sure will agree it's a hard assignment to speak about him. One reason, I think, is that all of us who felt close to him know that no words can convey the substance of the man to those who knew him only in a guarded, professional way. It's impossible to convey his brilliance, which he was actually shy to exhibit, or his warmth, which he withheld until he felt he could trust you with it. For a good number of people, that meant never. Or his wit, which he reserved for those who would not be bewildered by it. Now, I've been asked to speak in particular about Stephen's engagement with two institutions, the National Humanities Center in North Carolina and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in Cambridge. In each case, I, own my, I owe my own affiliation largely to him. But uh, I'm bad at following directions, so I'd like also to say a few words about his lifelong commitment to Columbia, with which for me he was almost synonymous. But first, although I know the hour grows late, I ask your indulgence in allowing me to say a little more about his mind and heart as they were expressed in his writing, samples of which, wonderful samples of which we've heard tonight. Stephen was never a new critic in the exclusionary sense of insulating text from context. Yet like the best of the new critics, he illuminated every text he wrote about with an almost sacramental intensity. He was an incomparable close reader. But he was also an intellectual historian, a comparatist, a sociologist, a kind of biographer, a versatile and entertaining reviewer, a savvy observer of politics, academic and otherwise, a lacerating critic of pretentious writing, whether it was old-style literary history of the encyclopedic sort, of which he once wrote that it plunged him into a, quote, twilight of stupefaction, or the willfully obscure literary theory that became the coin of the realm in the 70s and 80s and is still the leading currency today though as he predicted, it has lost almost all its purchasing power outside its local economy. Stephen was, as the phrase goes, ahead of his time. 
by using texts, often texts, as we all know, outside the so-called literary canon as windows into culture, he practiced the new historicism long before it declared itself to be new. He did cultural studies long before it became the thing to do. In the other Victorians, he wrote, as you've heard, about a pornographic memoir, My Secret Life, first published in the 1880s, whose author chronicles his relentless search for one orgasm after another at impressively short intervals between the last and the next. Stephen revealed how this author, in a repulsive way, and you've heard some of that too, reduced his partners, if one can call them that, to fluids and orifices. But he also, that is Stephen also, revealed the pathos of a man in the grip of an addiction by which he sought to escape himself. And while the prose of the other Victorians has a sort of clinical cool, Stephen allowed himself in the footnotes to be playful and mischievous, as when he observes that while the preapic protagonist was prowling for sex, the eminent Victorian William Gladstone, quote, walked the same streets at night, accosted prostitutes, and tried to help them, to offer them aid or even take them home to tea. In that small footnote, one sees something, I think, of the inner struggle of Victorian Britain with itself. When I reread that book recently, I found myself thinking of certain scenes in the last film, Eyes Wide Shut, by Stephen's childhood friend Stanley Kubrick, about whom he told me some delicious stories. Two precocious Jewish boys from the Bronx, kindred spirits who grew up to become brilliant anatomists of human obsession, dread, and hope. I doubt there will ever be a pair like them again. I want to say one more thing about Stephen specifically as a literary critic. It's the very rare critic who can intersperse his or her own words on the page with the words of a truly great writer and not cause the reader to wince at the juxtaposition. Stephen could and did do it. I want to read, since I'm jealous of all the others who've had a chance to read something by Stephen, uh, one paragraph that comes toward the end of Dickens from Pickwick to Dombey. Now, just by virtue of the fact that Dickens was a 19th century novelist and Marcus was a 20th century professor, you may be able to tell which words are whose, but there's no yawning gap between them. With his stiff white cravat, creaking boots and loudly ticking watch, his bleak restraint and hard unbending will, Dombey is representative of a life which denies the erotic feelings and almost everything that has to do with the natural animal life of man. Dombey's house is a genteel mausoleum. His cold collations chill the marrow, and as he presides over his festivities, he might have been hung up for sale at a Russian fair as a specimen of a frozen gentleman. When he considers marrying Edith, it is to picture to himself this proud and stately woman doing the honors of his house and chilling his guests after his own manner. He moves like a man of wood without a hinge or joint in him. And as he sits alone in the dining room of the sterile and moribund family into which he is marrying, the scene is so dark and funereal as to want nothing in it but a body to be complete. Dombey, Dickens adds, is no bad representation of the body in his unbending form, if not in his attitude. He is at one point likened to a statue, at another to a man living encased in cold, hard armor. Dombey, in other words, is alienated from his body, and the rigidity that makes him seem one piece and not a man with limbs and joints is the armor and disguise of his impotence. Now some misguided people confused Stephen's own poker-faced severity with the features of a being like Bomb Dombey. But everyone who knew him knows that this was grossly wrong. 
One of the other ways in which Stephen confused people was that he was politically unclassifiable. He understood the almost erotic appeal of ideology, which he once defined as, quote, thought socially determined yet unconscious of its determination. A form of unawareness to which Stephen himself was no doubt sometimes susceptible as we all are. He was impatient with the renovation fantasies of the left, but no less so with the reflexive reactions of the right. He was an incrementalist who believed in progress, but he had no patience for the naive idea that change is necessarily progressive. So finally, I come to my assigned topic, about which I, because of my own loquacity, must now be brief. Stephen cared about institutions, I think, because he saw them as bulwarks against the human fallibilities I've just been talking about and that he wrote about so brilliantly. The first institutional context in which I saw him was the Columbia English Department. Upon my arrival as a new associate professor in 1985, he honored me by including me on a search committee for a new hire. I was starry-eyed to find myself among such luminaries as Frank Kermode, Edward Said, and Ann Douglas, not to mention Stephen himself, who was chair. We interviewed candidates in his office, and then in order to prevent senior members from bullying the novices like me, and in order to motivate me and my younger peers to do our best, he forbade any discussion right after the candidate left the room and required all of us, elders and youngsters alike, first to write out a comment and pass it in to him, which he would then read aloud to the whole group with attribution. This was much more terrifying than my recent PhD oral exam. Here was Stephen Marcus reading my and everyone's scribble with no chance for us to hem or haw or retract or refine what we had written. And it worked. Those were the fairest and most serious deliberations of any search committee I've seen in action since. He had a way of getting the best out of people, one reason why he was such a great teacher. At the National Humanities Center, Stephen was the last surviving founder after the passing of Charles Frankel, Morton Bloomfield, Gregory Vlastos, John Voss, Frederick Burkhart, Henry Nash Smith, Meyer Abrams, and Bob Goheen. Yes, all male and white, but that's how it was in those days. And it would be hard to assemble a more distinguished group of scholars before or since. Stephen was more relaxed in North Carolina than in Morningside Heights knowing, perhaps, that he was not regarded there as the heir to Lionel Trilling or the power broker of the English department. It was a place he associated with low stress. He had gone there to recover from his first heart attack. I think he associated it with health restored, intellectual exchanges free or as free as they can ever be of rivalry and point scoring and pettiness. I see him still in the building itself, which, as those of you who've been there know, has a cool, blanched exterior, but is filled with light and warmth. Many North Carolina memories stay with me, but I'd like to share one in particular. In the 1990s, after I had joined the Board of Trustees, the center was debating the future of its education programs consisting mainly of seminars for local high school teachers and other constituencies beyond the cloistered academy. For budgetary reasons, these programs were in danger of being jettisoned as the center prepared for a capital campaign for which it had to prove its fiscal responsibility by paring away anything dispensable. The pro and con discussion went back and forth. At one moment, the education program seemed destined to survive. At the next moment, some heavyweight trustee would trash them as deficient in one way or another, 
and unworthy of a world-class research center, and they seemed doomed. Stephen had said nothing through most of the meeting until toward the end of the afternoon. He spoke up very briefly and very quietly. While acknowledging that these programs were ancillary to the central purpose of the institution, namely research fellowships, he said, and I'll remember it very well, I think we all understand that this institution would be in some significant way diminished without them. That was it. The skeptics retreated, the advocates retired, and the education programs are still thriving today, with a significant portion of the center endowment earmarked for them. I strongly suspect they would not still exist without Stephen's intervention. As for the American Academy located in Cambridge, a place Stephen liked less than Durham or Chapel Hill, but whose work he respected, he served as editor of the Academy, in which role he tried to bring the journal Daedalus to a higher level of quality and salience to national and international problems. He was, in particular, one of the driving forces behind the Humanities Indicators Project, an effort to assemble and disseminate reliable data about how resources are deployed in support of the humanities, who and where the students are, what they're studying, and what becomes of them after they get their degrees, if they get their degrees. All on the premise that information is better than intuition, and that perhaps our endless arguments about the fate of the humanities could become a bit more grounded in measurable reality. The center and the academy, not to mention this university, are immeasurably diminished by Stephen Marcus's absence. He was the best of his generation and one of the best ever. Let us hope that the institutions he helped to build and sustain will live up, or at least try to live up, to the standard he set for them and for us. Thank you. I'm Lauren Goodlad. Uh, it's increasingly clear to me what an understatement it is for me to say that I was fortunate to be one of Stephen's students, as well as a member of the seminar that Nancy mentioned earlier. I'm also fortunate to be speaking on behalf of Robert Newsom, who could not be here today, as well as myself. I promised Eileen that I would keep it short, so what I'm about to read is edited from what is in your booklet. You may not want to bother with that. It is excerpts from the beginning and the end of the extraordinary 1966 review of Madness and Civilization in Praise of Folly. I won't try to characterize it. It will be very clear to you why Bob Newsom, Bob Newsom and I uh, emailed Eileen within seconds and both asked if we could read excerpts from it. There is much to be said in criticism of Foucault's study of madness. It is written in a prose of an obscurity so dense as to be often impenetrable. This is not so much the result of its genuine difficulty as of the author's arrogance, carelessness, and imprecision. Helter-skelter, he employs whole sets of technical terms which are only half assimilated to the matters he is discussing. Indeed, he rarely bothers to define them, much less to use them consistently. The tone of the prose is high-flown and portentous. Although the book is organized generally along chronological lines, reading through most of these chapters is like wading through several feet of water. Paragraphs do not follow one another in logical order. Great lacunae open up between what are apparently supposed to be consecutive parts of a discussion. Conclusions are sometimes offered in advance of evidence, 
and sometimes they are offered in place of evidence. Such charges would be grave indeed if they were brought to bear upon another book. In Foucault's work, they seem in the end hardly to matter. Foucault has attempted exhaustively to dramatize from within the appearances ascribed to madness during the last 500 years. He has not, however, attempted to explain why this all happened or what it means. He has not done so because he does not, in the first place, believe in the validity of such kinds of explanation. And in second, he does not believe that madness or unreason can be explained. For him, it is both a fundamental and ultimate category of human existence, and its utterances reveal ultimate truths. At this point, it seems to me relevant to say that Foucault has written a history of the devil's party and knows it, and that madness and civilization is a kind of contemporary version of the marriage of heaven and hell. This is from the end. What Foucault is finally against is the authority of reason. From Hegel to Marx, Darwin, Freud, Weber, and Durkheim, the 19th century brought forth vast analytical systems through which history, society, and the individual were made to appear as complex, coherent wholes. Although he thoroughly understands such systems, Foucault no longer has any belief in their authority. They are no longer vivid or surprising. There is much that they have failed to explain and much that they have explained inadequately or incorrectly. The great historical systems have themselves become part of the history that they both invented and transformed. In this, Foucault represents an important tendency in advanced contemporary thought. In his despair of the transcendent powers of the rational intellect, Foucault embodies one abiding truth of our time, the failure of the 19th century to make good on its promises. This is partly why he turns at the end to the mad and half-mad artists and thinkers of the modern age, Saad, Nietzsche, Van Gogh, et al. The language of their art dramatizes the culpability of the world and forces it to reorder its consciousness. One cannot in good conscience deny the force and truth of these observations. They catch a reality of the intellectual situation of the present moment, a moment that is coming to think of itself as post everything. Yet, I should like to enter one reservation that Foucault's remarkable work brings continually to mind. Post everything as we are, we are in the position of having rejected the great 19th and 20th century systems of thought without having superseded them, of having outworn them without having transcended them with new truth or discovering anything of comparable magnitude to take their place. I take this to reveal not so much the desperate situation of the contemporary mind, as the luxury of intellectual life. For even as we reject the large categories invented by the past, we continue to live on their capital. Those bearded old men left us an inheritance so rich that short of blowing it all up, we can hardly fritter it away. It is this condition of unprecedented affluence that has permitted Foucault to write a brilliant work about the history of psychology while rejecting psychology itself and without feeling any compunction to subsume the repudiated categories within some more inclusive and deeper set of analytic ideas. 
It has also permitted him to write a work about the relation of reason and madness, which is con consciously an instance of the phenomenon it is discussing, and which rejects transcendence as a game not worth the effort. This kind of intellectual relaxation, this easy living of the spirit, in which I might repeat, most of us participate, is only possible in an age which is aware of how much it still has to fall back on. So this um, is a passage from uh, Stephen's New York Times book review uh, on April 1998 on the occasion of um, the 150th year anniversary of the publication of the Communist Manifesto. And it's called Marx's Masterpiece at 150. Today, in the deepening twilight of the 20th century, in a culture that finds curious pleasure in inventing post-phenomena for its characteristic phases of experience, one grand matter that appears not to have passed into the quaint status of being post itself is bourgeois society. Whether it is regarded as capitalist democracy or civil society as the welfare state in transition or as the modern social contract, bourgeois society remains alive and well, which means, of course, as it always has, that it is in a hell of a state. Readers who come to the manifesto today will find much that remains striking and pertinent, and nothing more so than when Marx and, and, Marx and Engels' vision of capitalism's triumphant globalization. And here he's quoting. Modern industry has established the world market for which the discovery of America paved the way. The bourgeoisie has, through its exploitation of the world market, given a cosmopolitan character to production and consumption in every country. In place of the old wants satisfied by the productions of the country, we find new wants requiring for their satisfaction the products of distant lands. In place of the old local and national seclusion and self-sufficiency, we have universal interdependence of nations. And as in material, so also in intellectual production." End quote. And then Stephen has a one-line paragraph that comes after that. This was written in 1848. What more can one ask for? Hi, um, I'm Leonard Davis. I met Stephen for the first time in 1968 when I was an undergraduate at Columbia. Um, and I knew him as a, as a great professor, as a, he directed my dissertation, and a, as a colleague, and I would add, hopefully, friend. friend. And um, I realized that just today in listening to everybody, there's something really familiar about Stephen. And I mean familiar in the sense that he was, I always felt he was like my family. Uh, he, uh, I knew him longer than I knew my mother or father, so he's filled an important, if you want to say, psychoanalytic uh, position in my life. And I got, I got the invitation a little late, so when Eileen listed all the excerpts that were taken, um, I, I, they were all, all the good ones were taken. I mean, I probably would have taken Eric's uh, if I had a choice uh, about the sewers and the uh, living in excrement, but um, I decided instead to pick something that was totally bland in a way, but so really reflective of Stephen, uh, and this is from an excerpt from Freud and the Culture of Psychoanalysis, but I, I should preface it just by saying that when I worked on my dissertation with Stephen, I remember one day going into his office and, you know, he looked at, some, you know, the stuff I had written uh, and said, you must de-absolutize. And I had, sort of had no idea what he meant, but uh, it seemed like a very important piece of information. And then what I began to realize in listening to you all, but also in, in reading his work again, is that Stephen 
probably himself was saying that to himself because he made very grand claims and he gave me and I think his other students the desire to make grand claims but also then to step back from them. And so I think that what I'm about to read has that nice uh, dynamic in it. He says, I propose to bring these incomplete remarks to an end. What I have been trying to demonstrate is that there occurs across the 70 year period in English literature and culture a coherent discourse at the very highest pitch of consciousness among the most acute minds of, a, of the dominant culture. This discourse in all its ramification amounts, to, amounts in uncanny ways to a prefiguration and thought and culture of what the last 30 years or so we have begun to see being acted out in the lives of large numbers of individuals in advanced or late capitalist society and certain institutions peculiar to it. I do not know whether there are lessons to be learned here, and I do not believe that what we know historically enables us to predict what will happen next. I do think, however, that this consultation of part of the history of our culture helps clarify for us how we have come to be where we are, where we came from, and to what indeed we are not returning. And it just seems to me to be like a perfectly balanced set of statements about uh, a, a huge uh, statement about culture and this part of Stephen that I think everyone's talking about of this reserve, this tempering of his uh, uh, intelligence. Thank you. Good afternoon. Yeah. On behalf of Stephen Marcus and our family, I would like to thank all of you from our heart for your wonderful celebration of his life, of Stephen's life, work and contributions to the humanities and the world of ideas and letters. In particular, I would like to express our deep gratitude to all his former students for all their love and care, for Stephen as their teacher and mentor, and for making this memorial celebration today possible and festive. Their selections from his work and their comments represented a major part of today's remembrance of him and their commitment to his memory. Exceptional thanks are due to Dr. Rita Sharon and Eileen, Dr. Eileen Giluli, both of whom conceived of the celebration and made it today's reality. It was an endeavor of love and deepest commitment on their part. Professor Alfred Hornung of the University of Mainz in Germany traveled all the way to speak to today's celebration in remembrance of Stephen. Endless thanks are also due to Professor Andrew de Banco, who represented both the National Humanities Center and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. I would also like to thank Dr. Professor Stewart, Chairman of the Department, for his wonderful analysis of Stephen's life at the university and his career in the department. Warm thanks also due to Dr. Susan Vaughan, Chair of the New York Psychoanalytic Research Center at Columbia University and for a eulogy on Stephen's contributions to psychoanalysis. Last but not least, deep thanks to Dr. Rita Sharon, professor of medicine at Columbia University, highlighting Stephen's work in the field of medicine, starting as principal investigator in the program of values and ethics in healthcare in the 1970s at the Columbia Medical School as a forerunner of what was to become the field of medical ethics. A special thanks goes to Johnny Gunzelsman, the distinguished violinist to play music with our son, John Marcus, for the celebration memorial today. 
My comments would be incomplete without mentioning Stephen Marcus and his private life. For over 50 years, he was my husband, my partner, my closest friend, and spiritual colleague. He was a most devoted and loving father to our son, John Marcus, and the closest and loving relationship he extended to his daughter-in-law, Dr. Miriam Toczynski, and his newborn grandson, Asa Sky Marcus. Let me emphasize that without Stephen, my life is diminished by more than half, and the glorious memories of our close relationship and life together will need to sustain me. Moreover, I'd like to mention that Stephen enjoyed many close friendships in both his professional and private lives. He was a dedicated friend with people here and abroad, and he was loyal and steadfast in his commitment and care for them. Some of you are here today, and some of the, the, his friends sent messages of their love and commitment. Thank you all. Let me conclude by adding one other special aspect of Stephen's life and work, which was not mentioned today, his love of poetry. I will read from the last thing he wrote before his death. It is about Wordsworth's prelude, a paragraph he wrote for my essay on the emancipation of children in modern Western culture. He wrote, in the poetry of Wordsworth, the representation of childhood is a focus of interest. As he wrote in Intimation of Immortality Ode, heaven lies about us in our infancy. Wordsworth seems, as Stephen continued, actually to be making original discoveries about children. In such poems as We Are Seven, an anecdote for fathers, he reveals in concrete narratives how different mentally our young children from adults and respects and defends them against adult correction and coercion. In the prelude, the most original, Stephen says, the most original and extended autobiographical poem in the English language. He endeavors to depict how his vocation as a poet and as a feeling human being was brought about by his early experiences. In one daring passage, Stephen continues, he attributes the origin of poetry and of the imagination to nothing less than the baby attached to and drinking in both nourishment and love from the mother, as well as the fusion of perception, security, and active mental power from the primacy and universal symbiosis of our earliest experiences. He continues and concludes with excerpts from from the prelude book to blessed the, the, bless the infant babe. May I just read it for you? For with my best conjecture, I would trace our being's early progress. Bless the babe, nursed in his mother's arm, who sinks to sleep, rocked on his mother's breast, who with his soul drinks in the feelings of his mother's eye. For him, in one dear presence, there exists a virtue which irradiates and exalts objects through widest intercourse of sense. No outcast he, bewildered and depressed. Along his infant veins are interfused the gravitation and the filial bones of nature that connect him with the world. Emphatically such a being lives, frail creature as he is, helpless as frail, an inmate of this active universe, for feeling has to him imparted power, that thought that through the growing faculties of sense, thus like an agent of the great one mind, create, create, and receive both, working but in alliance with the works which it beholds. Such verily is the very poetic spirit of our human life, by uniform control of after years, through every change of growth and of decay, preeminent till death. I thank you very much.
My name is Ray Silver. I'm a professor at Barnard College and at Columbia University. My lab is located here just across the lane. Um, on behalf of um, Stephen and John, I've been given permission to say a few words as I felt very strongly that there was no possibility of homage to Stephen without some mention of Gertrude and the family. So we met um, over 35 years ago when we discovered that our sons were born on the exact same day, on August 31st, 1976. And I think we both got goosebumps. And their firstborn child was born on the same day on August 1st. I didn't get goosebumps on that part. Um, Miriam and John met at our house as we often celebrated Thanksgiving together and that's where they found each other. So we have long, close ties to the family. Those associations are meaningless. They're just random events, but they elicit fond emotions and strong memories. So um, the, the Stephen and Gertrude's marriage was a long one, as you've heard, over 50 years, and it was based on incredible trust and love there are so many examples, but I give you one that always shocked me. When, you all know that Stephen, when he retired, went to Montauk and never came back to New York. And that home in Montauk was bought by Gertrude when Stephen was out of the country working, and Gertrude made the decision herself that that would be a fine place to live. That's amazing. Someone mentioned that they didn't know where Stephen got the reserves of time and patience to mentor all of you. Well, he got a lot of the reserves of time and patience because Gertrude provided all the daily necessities, the food, the meals, the uh, phone calls for endless arrangements of the home and of the travels. So... Um, as a psychologist, I think of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and that hierarchy of needs states that a lot of basic requirements for life have to be in order to achieve that high intellectual uh, leeway. And Gertrude and John provided that emotional and mental and physical support for all that. So on behalf of Stephen, I thank Gertrude. So I think the last um, thing that we're going to play for you, um, since there was, I don't know, it, I guess obviously it spanned a lot of my father's work, but I, one of the elements was, uh, since Freud was um, something that he wrote about quite a bit, we thought that leaving you with Vienna around the turn of the century might be a nice place. Um, these are three short pieces by Fritz Kreisler. Um, one is Liebeslied, one is Schön Rosmarin, and the last one is a uh, short piece on a theme by Beethoven. But I think if the um, the feeling of, of love leaves you with this evening, uh, I, I hope that we can help contribute that way. So thank you.
Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you for bringing him back in a way that we'll never forget. And please stay now. There's food, there's drink, and we have time to share even more among us. Thank you for being here.